Welcome. This is a December 20th Open ZFS production users call. We have myself, Michael, we have Greg, Jan, and Steve. Others may join. And if anything, I would love to talk about clever strategies on snapshot formats, specifically their names. And every appliance or utility or script has had an opinion. Some are flexible, like I see ZREPL has the choice of like dense format, human readable, ISO 8601 and Unix epoch time. But I would love to hear from those present, what has worked well for you, what's burn you, burned you in the behind. And of course, is there ever an ultimate format that would satisfy human and machine readable needs? Go. Uh, so I have run into this a bit I'm just sort of um, running out of patience for anything that does not have the time zone. So we've oh, fallen back to the 8601 for pretty much everything. And it, and, and, and then I'm never questioning, is it, you know, what, what is the time zone? Is it embedded in it or not? Can you give a just a quick scenario of when you sat down and found yourself scratching your head and kind of pissed that you didn't have the time zone? Like what was the exact real world scenario? <laughs> it it may not have been specifically on the snapshot. It may have been actually data embedded in MySQL that was sort of related back to um, the snapshot. Okay. Um, so I'm just thinking myself through it. Please. Um, when we when we take the snapshot, it does re the name does have the eighty six zero one, and then we're we're actually storing that snapshot name in my SQL along with some other stuff. My frustration might be that maybe the developer didn't um, make the time zone explicit in one of the my SQL fields, um, but in general, my my frustration is that. If you're recording an instant in time and your servers are spread across time zones and you did not include the time zone, like I'm going to be upset at some point. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Or, or and dissatisfied. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I'm looking at this 8601, if you're looking at the screen, there's like the, the, I, I've, I know they're throwing to NT and then the Z at the end, what exactly is indicating what time zone that is? Because, yeah. Uh, so don't quote me on this, sure. but I believe the Z means like UTC zero. Okay. Um, the way that actually, rather than me guess, I'm going to pull up some data on the side here and see what I see, but I am not super knowledgeable. Um, and in general, when, what I'm looking for is not that, that it has a time zone, but that the time instant is recorded at UTC zero or got it. If you get my point. Yeah. Because and Jan's from, making yeah. some good points in the chat there where it's like, well, with daylight savings times, yeah, not helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm using UTC and the uh, human setting might not be the best, but that's what I've been using. Yeah, and I find myself doing a whole bunch of just, okay, a daily snapshot with simply the date, and that's good enough for, you know, those purposes, and welcome on Trinig, and so I punch that in there, but then I can see how down the road um, you do want that verbosity, but uh, it's not super human-friendly to just quickly type in a, a UTC-friendly stamp, so I, I'm kind of torn on what can balance between the two or flag it as being, you know, make sure your replication thing is compatible with both human readable random ones and then properly structured ones and just 
hopefully it's handled nicely. Um, are you embedding something like a retention time, which like free nows, true nows would always put dash one W for one week retention, which is sometimes ignored, sometimes <laughs> you name it. Go ahead. I um, use um, the X fair, which does that. And um, yeah, the, putting the retention period or some kind of label in the name makes sense to me. So basically I want it to be timestamp and then any other part of the name. So it's one of the things which are important to me as a mostly human operator uh, is that the if there's a timestamp embedded anywhere in the snapshot name, the lexical order of snapshot names should be the chronological order. So sort dash so that the because the sorting in ZFS by name should just give me the right chronological order of things. So basically start with a snapshot format, the uh, timestamp format, which gives you that. Uh, daylight saving is um, just a terrible idea yeah. uh, to put in there. So I would prefer to just keep UTC in there without a time zone. Uh, you can put in anything after what if you like long names and yeah, but don't uh, basically get a randomized order if you sort by label. <laughs> So um, thinking out loud in English, are we lucky that, let's see, no week is alphabetically after months, <laughs> just saying. Yeah, so the important part is basically ISO uh, 8601. Yeah. Uh, is a good, and don't you don't have to preserve more precision than your interval requires. So it's just so that two consecutive snapshots. Yeah must basically be strongly monotonic. So mm -hmm. the time resolution preserved in your timestamp has to be, let's say, down to the hour at least. But if you only have date and hour and that's, yeah, good, that's quite a bit shorter than having a nanosecond or microsecond resolution timestamp. Um, yeah, unique seconds work if formatted correctly. Mm -hmm. Just having them as a decimal number does not really work because, in theory, you could get a new digit and then uh, it's no longer uh, the right order, so you have to basically zero pad the number to maximum uh, length. Over the decimal or the hexadecimal, even if you want it a bit shorter. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, hey, you could even do base 64. No, I don't think you can do You have to do a slightly modified base 64. But yeah, base 32 or 36 works. But it's completely undecodable to 99% of humanity uh, yeah. or more. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so yep. hex or decimal is better there. And I would just accept the length of the ISO one because... How often do you manually type it out, really? Well, lately on setting up a new system, I've been doing it quite frequently and carefully while getting certain yeah. things into place. So right there's that. Right, shell script, test uh, it, yeah. run it. Every time you type it, there's a chance you introduce a typo. Not so wrong. The other part is that it used to be very important to do that, especially... So with the retention period, either as a label or explicitly even as a duration, so that you have basically initial and duration in some tools, because that's how you had to do it to find a common ancestor to do an incremental replication a snapshot. But if your replication logic always uses bookmarks, you can ignore all of that because you can just continue with a bookmark. Mm -hmm. And modern tools like ZREPL do that. So basically having the tooling friendly name format so that you can infer the retention time and so on and find the ancestor to 
continue replication from is no longer that important, but the really the most important part, which uh, you still have to watch out for, is that your snapshots must never collide with themselves. So during daylight saving changes, the local time moves back. And oftentimes by exactly an hour and so on. So that potentially you, if you do hourly backups, you uh, can have a case that you basically the clock jumps back and then you try to create the same snapshot again and it will fail. And there's no way you can express that just in local time because by most definitions, the local time really did jump back and you have the same hour twice. And there's no way to reasonably encode that in this local time with a short format. Right. Because now, the, um, the snapshot itself has a date stamp embedded in it in the pro like properties. No, yes, what? but the name still has to be unique. Right. Can that can that embedded date also go back in time when there's a time change? Um if you are insane enough to run your Unix system in such a way like a Windows PC used to run that you really move back the system clock? Hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, don't do that. No. You change your time local time offset. Don't roll back the wall clock. Welcome if you back, basically Steve. have a time zone file, you let the wall clock tick on and only add a different offset, that's fine. So setting t the time zone environment variable does not create this problem. Configuring so your NTP service. Guys, could you a... draw or something? Hmm? So that's for the kids, just one second. Oh, sorry. So uh, really, I would just I am so sorry for run that. servers really always bad. with a zero offset, so UTC, uh, as the system clock, and then set the environment variable for the time zone as needed. Okay. And run as many services as possible with UTC as their implicit time zone. So Stu, we're talking time zone formats. I'm standing up a system and having to manually create snapshots, but I prefer they be human readable. But hey, the proper you know format would be ISO format. Oh, and by the way, I'd argue that if you had to kick out a snapshot to a file file on a file system, the colons would probably break certain file systems yeah. such as Apple's. So no, not really. They won't. OK. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the problem is that Apple used to use the colon as path separator in Mac OS Classic. Yeah. And the Carbon API preserved the macros, but they did it in such a way that they basically swap colons and slashes in most places. So okay, good. If you on the Unix level, you put in a colon and a file name uh, through the old API, it shows up uh, as a slash, and uh, the other way around. So they do a one for one replacement. Okay, uh, but we are path rewriting. Some tools may refuse it anyway. Um, but these days, for example, you can have a colon and a file name uh, on yeah. uh, Mac OS. Oh, that's good. Stu had something. We've used this, uh, we've used this pretty extensively. I've been surprised. Now, we're mostly Linux. Yeah. But I have actually not run into any trouble with the colon. And I was surprised because anytime I use space, I feel like I'm just setting myself up oh, for yeah. failure, right? And um, I see people using space all the time. I'm like, stop, please stop. But with the colon, the I was expecting uh, let him finish. I had none. Let him finish. Go ahead, Steve. And, yeah, I, I just I didn't have any trouble, and I was surprised. What is a problem is um, trailing spaces. Oh yeah, <laughs> because in Windows that is to this day prohibited. Uh, what they do instead is to cheat and use a uh, implementation specific Unicode code range. Yeah. And, and then we write that uh, and basically, yeah, present it as spaces, but it can't be encoded like that because back in the bad old days of FUT like 12 and 16 and with 8.3, 
uh, file format uh, file names um, with fixed size eight name and three suffix uh, bytes were basically filled up with white space so just ASCII space characters so um, basically that means that if you have a space at the end of a file name it's a shorter file name okay and to this day Windows has to preserve this behavior for compatibility reasons naturally Okay, so uh, just broadly, is everyone using UTC time on every single system, including their laptops and phones? Just because they're cool every, kids? Every every server is, yes. Okay. On my, I use it uh, sorry. everywhere, even my desktop, but not my phone. Not your phone. Oh, man. You... <laughs> uh, Go on ahead. my <laughs> phone, I use uh, local time according to GPS and uh, mobile network, but okay. uh, just because it, I mostly care about wall clock on my phone. Mm. Uh, the problem is which time zone if you have, uh, if you move across time zones. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's just not worth it to do all the time zone shift calculations uh, in your head. All my work sessions and like, I just set the system time zone to UTC and then set the TZ variable to the local time zone name. I see. So that, I have uh, a, I have a question. Go ahead, Steve. Um, so you said, tell me when you have felt, or or I think this is what you were asking is, tell me a specific instance when you have felt that um, recording the UTC time was necessary and saved you. I, I have a different question, which is, when wouldn't you want the UTC time to to sort of record an instant when something happened? I have an example for that. Awesome. I've, I've got six or seven as well. <laughs> the example is I have a, a SMB share with Samba 4, and I have a sim link to the snapshot directory so that my users can just use any file manager they want to uh, go into the snapshot directory. And uh, most users uh, are a bit confused that the timestamps, which are because again, it's just the snapshot directory or in the dot .zfs directory, uh, do not align with local time. Exactly. But I just tell them, yeah, deal with it because the alternative is worse mm -hmm. given how often you really have to recover data like that. Uh, without hand holding, um, it's just a question of trade offs, and it's firmly uh, on the side of put UTC in there, keep it simple, stupid. I was about to say anything user facing, <laughs> that, not anything the, because that that's that's the key, and and the the biggest thing in my in my past has been managing security systems. Yeah. Do not ask a security guard to do it minus seven on a timestamp. You know, that type of thing. I need the videos to be tied to access controls that are all in the local time zone. Otherwise, all hell breaks down. Interesting. Um, users should be able to input time in local time, they, but they, the system should work in UTC. The, so, because, I, no, I agree. But the this the system itself running in in UTC hundred percent, but the user interfaces to that system have mm -hmm. to be local aware. Yeah, and that's where things like uh, Postgres with its proper support for time date stamp with time zone comes in. Oh, okay. There you can record a time date stamp with time zone. The problem there is what happens, as has happened, when countries are tardy about shipping uh, updates to their time zone. So the ex most extreme case is uh, some little island jumping uh, across the uh, day, uh, line uh, divider. Right. Uh, after the update, so basically some software 
consider them a day apart from the legal date because it hasn't been updated because they decided, I think, two weeks before it took effect or something, the law was passed. And that was too short for everyone to ship an update for something uh, affecting a little island close to Australia. Hmm. Who wanted to have the same day of the week as Australia because it was their main trading partner? So I, I, had, I, I had a similar situation a couple of months ago when I joined the scientists, and I just told them point blank every system is going to change its time to UTC, deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, then go to hell or just don't use the server. A calm, and then don't put it like that. And and I gave them a very simple solution. If you want, you can set the, I think, does uh, something environment variable in your own profile. So like when you type in date, for example, it will show it based on that environment variable. But expect that every time on the system, on all of the servers, especially since we have team members who are not in this country, uh, so UTC makes the most sense. And after you give them the reasons, uh, everyone from the, you know, uh, science intern to the uh, director get on board with it. Like it just not using UTC does not make sense uh, in a uh, quote unquote mainframe environment. I do think a, a scientific community should be able to get on board a little quicker than some other classes of users. Yes. Uh, yeah. But, 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 but the, for them, uh, what I was n not expecting is that for them, it was, and I'm quoting what they said is that it's weird. I'm like, what do you mean weird? They're like, well, we have to calculate plus four minus four every time. I'm like, be happy. You're not in America. We don't even do daylight saving. Uh, hmm. sadly, there are countries in uh, Europe which do it as well, and that's before you get into weird counter cases like 15 minute offsets oh. or multiple changes per uh, season. Well, there, there was a thing a couple of years ago about doing micro time zones, so it was all relative to the sun in your area. Hmm. It was all it was all offset directly from UTC, but it was all masked in your thing. So if a meeting came up at eleven forty two instead of eleven o'clock, you know that was one of the things around. Hey, this is where the sun is over me. That's the time that matters. Hmm. Okay. Are there any good resources for this kind of time management? especially user yes. facing what do you suggest so there there are some good articles in the ntp sec project which was supposed to be a security protocol built on top of ntp um uh, before building before starting the project we started with gathering articles and even writing articles about the details of the both the implementation as well as the ideas and the problems that NTP and time zone math overall had. I'm not sure if the repo is out there somewhere because that was like a decade ago and then the project died because we didn't get any funding. Um, but well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go over it and try to find, I'm pretty sure I should have it archived on my servers because I was also working on that project. I see ntpsec.org and a blog at one point uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, there was uh, no. It, it it is the same thing. There was okay. a there was a section on the website called resources with all the well guess resources. Let's see. Hopefully, it's still around. I I hope so. Press. Yeah. Oh, and media resources. Oops. Okay. Well, yeah. There's that. Because this air quotes shouldn't be a problem, but this is a problem, and yeah. Hmm. Okay. I don't want to go, you know, beat that entirely to death, but it's a it's a topic impacting me, and I've never quite had a policy or even a ZFS snapshot policy I'm satisfied with. So 
uh, by I'm the way, <laughs> go ahead. For, for, for your specific problem, what we used to do, or what we still do actually, is we 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 uh, do the uh, what do you call that? The um, the snapshot name we keep it in uh, epoch, Unix epoch specifically, yeah. and um, and then if we want to know about the like, creation of the snapshot, th th there is a creation uh, metadata in yeah. in the DFS get. And that one is actually uses libc and it's local aware. No, oh, sorry, that, not local. that was a question uh, earlier before you joined. Cool. Okay. Well, local oh. aware as in the oh, formatting uh, as human readable as local mm -hmm. aware. Uh, the, uh, no, it's, it's both local as well as uh, based on the time zone that you're at because it saves the data itself in, in, an, in an epoch format. So it will show it based on your time zone. So yeah, but it records as seconds from epoch, not yes. as date and time and time zone. Exactly. It's so, only the human readable output, which is formatted according to the TZ variable. Yes. So which 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 means that that makes the perfect sense to if you want to like sort something for yourself. I mean, not for scripting, but for human readability rather yeah for let's say operator comfort not user comfort i would uh, always uh, insist on a format which sorts lexicographically uh, in chronological order so that sort mm. just a, a naive uh, sort with no special sorting logic gives me the chronological sorting order. Something like uh, ISO uh, 8601 or so, whatever your number is. So year, month, date, hour, minute, second, or uh, truncate that to however uh, many fields you need. Um, but anything else is just annoying to work with if you have to debug something and write quick one-off scripts to filter the output. Yeah. Then I don't want to have to, or even if, if I only have the snapshots written into files, I don't want to have to uh, import them or use user space CFS to extract the fields or something. Mm, just give me it in an easy to process format which is good enough for humans and then if I need a user interface on top of that then that's a problem for the user interface so maybe generate a directory full of symlinks with the other names yeah Just, and, and uh, the, the, there was also the point like a, a security person with a camera let's say uh, we, we had a similar problem and like we we chose the security software based on the fact that you could change its well language first of all and the time zone. So the the I don't know that 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 the, these are I, these are kind of issues so, that should have been solved after fifty years of computing. Yeah, but How are they not solved? The problem <laughs> is that it's not just a technical problem because there have been cases where countries basically retroactively changed their time zones. Oh. Yep, what? Bro, busy. yep, they just said that, yeah, and it applies retroactively. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Because at the time it wasn't a big problem, but that, how do you deal with it as software? There is no sane solution to that. You can only basically do convert the time at the point where you record it and then apply it because. In that case, yeah, if the definition of the time zone changes, uh, yeah, the other problem is what if, if a date is entered, like let's say we schedule a meeting in a year from now, we meet again, and then the time zone definition changes. Does the, and especially if they are presented in different time zones, which one is the authoritative one? Or did you do you convert at the point you record into UTC and then that's the canonical one? By the way, our Armenia stopped daylight saving because we had a problem like that. Like yeah. what, what, one one day someone 
from the government changed the standard at the who who, who maintains the database the these days? Is it IEEE? Yeah. I guess I don't know whoever it was, and then some people woke up and they saw, they saw their Windows XP and Windows Vista have a different time than what what it's supposed yeah. to be. Oh, you and then wired. And then the government was like, oh, this is this is too useless. Let's just not do daylight saving anymore. And um, let's do it one more time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and and that was it. So yeah, the other problem is what do you do with software which doesn't get updates like air gap security systems or industrial control systems or car for, without mobile crap in them? They just have whatever time zone offset is burned into their firmware. It's even more fun than when one cell tower in an area doesn't take the state <laughs> update. Oh, wow. oh, interesting. There, it was actually in my when I lived in Montana, and there's one in Big Fork that was an hour behind. And yeah, once driving five miles through it, your time zone changed. Yeah, due to network fuck ups, I once had an interesting problem. The uh, IPv6 worked, but IPv4 didn't. And at the time, only one of my pool dot ntp dot whatever um, uh, servers uh, was reachable via IPv6, and that one had an offset of two hours relative to what it should have been. So my and, system uh... Uh, tried to sync to. Uh, Broken NTP server. And I might be wrong, but there was also an NTP system in Europe based on radio, or do I remember that correct? The, the, there is uh, in Germany at least there's a um uh short way yes. short um uh, what is it, DCF seven seven five or something seventy seven or seventy five or something kilohertz, and yeah that one does give you basically UTC and then a marker for uh, daylight saving in Germany mm -hmm. with an announcement before basically, yeah, it's now basically daylight saving is in effect or not of a single bit flag because there's so little bandwidth in the signal. Mm -hmm. But you can derive UTC from it and they haven't changed it in any incompatible way. And the nice thing about it is that, yeah, wherever you have an open window, you can... I have a little stub antenna, not much larger than a wireless antenna for, mm -hmm. um, and you get a reliable enough signal that you can basically keep your wall clock synced. Um, but it's kind of hard to get receivers for it because these days it's easier to kind of do something a lot more complicated and get a pulse per second from a GPS receiver GPS. or something. Which Has anyone done even... that with Raspberry Pis and friends and time machines? Yeah, people have. There's even anyone uh... here? I've got I've got one under my desk. Okay, cool. A Raspberry uh, Pi or one acting as time server with GPS? Raspberry Pi at, with a GPS head unit acting as a primary NTP server. Nice. Uh, I have Paul... three of them. <laughs> cool. But but what? To, sorry, I we have three of them. No. I, we have three of them, but they are not based on a GPS. They're based on a um, sun sensor, I think it's called. Hmm. Like you, you put it on ninety degrees, and it has a sensor all or for for like three hundred and sixty, mm -hmm. which 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 looks at the direction of the sun, and based mm -hmm. on the photons, it does like very precise, down to like a nanosecond calculations. Really? So, um, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's. Yeah, one of them is one dot the one dot am dot ntp dot org. The other one is two dot am dot ntp dot org, and the third one is three dot am dot ntp dot org. And they are managed by a free BSD server. Yeah. So, um, Paul Henning come did a hardware modification to an old single board computer, where he basically found a rubidium normal with the same frequency as the crystal on the main board. And he replaced the crystal oscillator with a rubidium frequency normal to oh, nice. an offline capable system because then he had a very precise system clock generator so that you, yeah, he could barely run for months probably without 
losing meaningful amounts of precision given the mm -hmm. jitter and inherent in NTP. If you want to get even closer, you can use precision time protocol with a NIC capable of timestamping frames in hardware. Previously yeah. does support that. Uh, and there are implementations for that in ports. So what that means is basically whenever a Ethernet frame is queued by the network card, it will take a timestamp in hardware slash firmware so that you don't uh, get the jitter until the interrupt is scheduled. Oh, that's uh, nice. When it comes to timestamping, in that way you can really get not just down below nanosecond, but down to microseconds or potentially nanoseconds resolution. Uh, but that's really, then you need a grandmaster clock with, basically if you want to run it offline, you kind of have to run your own real, real atomic clock. And if you're crazy enough to do that, there is a Raspberry Pi shield, which costs a few, two or three thousand uh, dollars and has a um, atomic clock on it. And yeah, then you can do it. Uh, uh, Antrinic, um, shoot a link to your optical one. That's pretty cool sounding. And when I when I mention resources, I do mean things like this that I just found. It's a a lovely overview slash crash course on like timekeeping in Unix and on computers. And I'm I, I guarantee the broader users of the world are not super up on this. Locales, oh, times and data. It's just one of the better overviews I found. If you got better one ones, please the, keep them coming. <laughs> one of the other problems you will encounter, but normally it's not a problem for ZFS snapshotting because you don't do it at that resolution. Yep. Uh, is leap seconds. Yep because uh, you can have things which will break data validations because you can have something like 23 hours and 60 minutes <laughs> uh, as a timestamp that's valid mm -hmm. yes. according to timestamping rules, but of course it isn't valid. And, and yeah, it just so happened that during the timestamp, Basically, during Unix's formative years, no leap seconds were uh, announced by the um, astrophysicists. So yeah, it didn't get implemented until it was too late. And now the question is, what do you do? Do you jump the, because this is below the resolution of time zones, do you jump the system clock? Uh, or what do you do to key, do you accept that the Unix timestamp and the leap seconds. So basically Unix time and uh, astronomic time will diverge over time by some number of seconds, probably ever growing number of seconds. Mm -hmm. Or do you uh, smudge that? And that's something which has, I think, caused real uh, discussions among the NTP server operators of what they should do. Should they follow the astronomical time or st just a second since Unix Epoch? Okay. Epoch version two. Yeah, yeah. should they just smudge <laughs> and how to apply that? Is it acceptable to smudge the sleep second over the day it is taking effect in so that basically every second is one whatever many seconds per day longer? Um, over that day, so you basically slow down the clock for one day, so that or accelerate it potentially. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I do want to emphasize resources to keep it actionable for people in the field and those taking snapshots. Okay, the but anyway, basic thing is, uh, oh, here's and use there's NTP a list of... uh, and Goodness. sortable timestamps with enough resolution to be unique and okay. avoid taking the uniqueness part in local time. If you want both, just repeat yourself. Yes. Uh, firing post. At least that's cool. the lessons I've taken from. Got it. Lots of links. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I say we shift gears. Anyone have a topic before we talk D-Raid, which Antrenig had questions about?
Antoinette. Maybe we should, should quickly mention the um, better solution because one of the reasons why the sorting and so on used to be so important is that the only way you could basically base an incremental replication snapshot, uh, sorry, incremental replication stream was to base it on an existing snapshot already present in the system you wanted to receive the snapshot into, which is why there used to be discussions about, so how to pick a naming scheme, which makes it easy in a shell script most of the time right. to find the right starting point for your application run. Uh, but since ZFS has uh, bookmarks now, you can just use bookmarks for your replication position. And then you don't have to worry about ripping out unreplicated snapshots which never made it to the target system or thinning out a snapshot which would otherwise be used as a starting point uh, for your incremental replication, so which used to break scripts if you stop the replication long enough, for example, so, so that the weekly snapshot, which just was the last one to make it through the last time your replication made some progress. Yeah. Um, and now that we, this weekly one has been removed and you only have a newer daily one or something, and then you had to manually do a one-off resynchronization to the one where the record is intact on both sides, and then you could continue it. Well, can you retroactively create a, a bookmark and say, hey, the, the I, problem I really is wish I had one of this sender and receiver have to agree to use uh, and support uh, bookmarks. Right. So you basically, your replication solution has to support them. Um, but, that's the important part. So your pool version has to be new enough to record oh, them. Of course, well, that's implied. But um, if you think, oh, no, I'm missing a point in time. We have the transaction group and the bookmark doesn't, you know, contain a diff. Never data. had to do that. You can't just say, hey, I want a bookmark at this point. I don't like... know. OK, go ahead. I'll just make a note of that. But this is basically a state you shouldn't encounter um, unless you intentionally create it or your uh, software is bro just broken. Right. Uh, uh, has yeah, ever it's... anyone noticed projects not supporting bookmarks or replication? Yes. Uh, All of the of older <laughs> ones which never got updated to make use of them. Yeah. What? So all uh, of the ones with, with uh, yeah, a decade to build up a good position on the Google search list. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, point to this. I guess your oldest snapshot is still your oldest, but you don't want to lose it in that way. But that's a whole and different the topic. The part yeah. is that as long as you're... These kinds of things are, are stuff you really um, don't want to mess with because I thought these are your backups. So if it works for you and it most, even if it mostly works for you and you know the missing stairs, it's tempting to just keep on using it. So there's a lot of inertia there to overcome uh, before someone uh, migrates an existing storage environment to a new backup uh, script or yeah. so our quick show of hands does do do people have favorite snapshot and replication tools be it sanoid be it zrepl be it zx for be it anything else uh, i'm i'm using uh uh Z -Z zfs snap 2 or was it snap zfs 2 i don't remember which one yeah, so the first snap, so the first snap, right? I remember the name correctly. So the first snap too, and uh, uh, I'm doing that in a cron to automate the uh, snapshotting process. Go, oh. and then I send it with um, ZXFR. Do I remember that name correctly? I hope ZX or that's yeah, that's yeah, the classic. That yeah, yeah, I think. 
Alan. Yeah, uh, Al to, yeah. To this day. Yes, yes, that one. And um, I don't even know if it really supports it because uh, it hasn't. It I haven't to had issues. It, but uh, yeah, but if you do it correctly, uh, I think it has uh, this grandfathering protection logic so that it doesn't thin out uh, the last few snapshots. So um, there's some timestamp protection logic so that Anyhow. it doesn't run into this situation easily. Steve, Stu, yeah. favorite tools? Uh, I'd have to check with our guys. I, they selected something, but I, I can't recall what it was. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, and furthermore, thing I noticed that like ZREPL was rather machine to machine institutionally oriented, and I'm often doing like one time ad hoc, will never be repeated replications, just like kind of recover off some snapshots and ah there, i i do not know what the perfect answers are but that's okay it's a journey um shall we talk d-raid once again um i was i was going to ask about that because um my organization is looking forward to buy a petabyte system and uh I told them, I told them jokingly, of course, as if we've already understood how to handle our terabyte system. Now we want to buy a petabyte system. Sure. So <laughs> uh, it's been hell of a journey. Um, no, uh, the petabyte system, uh, we've already learned the mistakes that we did with the current system, which was like, don't tell Windows admins to buy a storage system. They will buy hardware RAID and then I will suffer. Finally, that mistake got fixed. So, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't know if there are any best practices or things that I should think about before buying such systems. Anyone has any experience in that area? Are you watching the screen? Jan rattled off a few earlier. And, you know, key, one key point was like, have a D-RAID per JBOD because your growth is not like, you know, RAID Z. So, um, go ahead. At around... Uh petabyte other uh, ideas become possible because if you have to basically be um, resilient against the failure of whole JBOTs or HPAs, these are things which are unlikely to fail but can fail. But you mm -hmm. kind of can defend ZFS against that if you add an additional X to your sharding and you split your rate across basically one less than parity amount of disks per uh, j -bot, and then do the redundancy across multiple j -bots. The problem is that then your growth capacity becomes even larger and you basically can only grow by row rex or something, which is uh, in uh, not useful to most unless you're prepared to accept the overhead of triple uh, um, mirrors. And because at that scale, you kind of can't get away with double mirrors. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you lose a double mirror in your pool, the whole pool is um, gone for all intents and purposes. And that means that if the wrong two disks fail in your pool, your pool is gone, which isn't really acceptable for a petabyte level, uh, petabyte capacity. That, yeah. So then this means that you now need basically triple redundancy through triple mirroring, which means that you need, need lots of storage. And that's where basically the uh, sticker shock sets in for most uh, people. It can be that you need to do that for performance reasons. Then you have to explain to them why you need that many IOPS. Um, but if you don't need it because you need it as a backup solution, for example, then it would be really wasteful to do that and you're better served with some variation on parity instead of just mirroring. So, and the other thing is if a JBot dies or loses power or Bot is lost or something. Normally, not all of the disks in it are gone. 
It's just that the power supply of the J board failed or the power distribution board failed or an HBI uh, cooked itself to death that isn't permanent uh -huh. data loss. It's just downtime, which while annoying is uh, and a good way to uh, get awake in the morning uh, <laughs> is um, works better when, uh, when a full pot of coffee, I can assure you. Uh, but um, it's still, uh, it's, it's a shock in the morning and then it works again. <laughs> it's not a write free letters kinds of situation yeah. in a reasonable I, organization. I, I do have to ask, what did people do for petabyte storage before ZFS? Because so I don't even imagine the management. Money at NetApp. Uh, oh, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't mean like appliances is... like NetApp, like other at some than point, NetApp. Uh, if you go far enough back, you have to go to tape libraries. Well, okay. Yeah, but... but I don't think that they were petabyte sizes, right? Oh, there are multi petabyte tape libraries. Oh, really? Oh, that's it interesting. May even be uh, exabyte ones by now. Look at the size of the latest uh, LTO uh, tapes. I'm not familiar. What tape LTO? Uh, linear, uh, ta linear tape oh, open or yes. something. Basically, the most common surviving tape form yeah. factor, and they are like uncompressed raw capacity of 18 terabytes. LTO uh, 9. What? Yeah, LTO 9 looks like it's 18. Yeah, 18, uh, and they advise a compressed capacity. But yeah, that's uh, kind of a lie. I mean, at, at one point in time, mainframes had no storage. All storage was... No local well, storage. No they local. had FICON and stuff like that. Right. Mm. Yeah, but that's a but that was more of a buffer than real storage. So mm -hmm. the mainframe tape act tape activity was storage activity. So yeah. And that's you know, going back into the 70s, 80s, 90s, hell before we had oh. any real physical raids. And we were doing tape raids. Really? Oh goodness. Or uh, even parity <laughs> across multiple <laughs> tapes in a scratch. Yeah. If you go far back far okay. enough, it used to be possible to splice uh, torn tapes together again and so on. And people were even doing uh, parity similar to how uh, binary use groups were ran and basically apply parity to their data and then either stream it on a single tape, hoping that if it is damaged, the damage will not be long enough or, or catastrophic enough if they can't recover or even do parity rate across multiple tapes in a tape library. Hmm. And I suspect that at scale parity um, for, for or it's probably called a forward uh, error correction at that point. Uh, just doing Reed Solomon or more modern erasure um, coding. Forms. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Veritas is the question, is the answer. A yeah. good point, yep, yep. Ver Veritas but, file system was what Sun and Oracle did prior to ZFS. But mechanically, was it relying on hardware RAID cards or just lots of interfaces or something yeah. else entirely? I mean, I had a uh, three cabinet Hitachi storage rack of nine gigabyte drives. Wow. <laughs> that had RAID controllers in them that were then managed on top with Veritas um, file system and, oh, what the hell is that thing called? Veritas volume management? Yeah, as yeah, as yeah, a, that their file system and the whole management suite is in addition to the backup portion mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. So, uh, wasn't it some kind of early uh, B3 based Fast file system or something? Possibly. Honestly, it was so long ago, I don't remember. 
It was. It was. It was before my time. I'm sure it was expensive. Okay. I'm sure, I was not born. Antonik, does that answer I, your questions? <laughs> I had a trip to Vegas for the Kertos conference, so it was yeah. pretty wild. That brings so many more questions, but I think I'll, <laughs> I'll spend my time on Wikipedia this weekend. Cool. <laughs> Other questions, ladies and gentlemen. Want to spend some time with family if you want to see them again. <laughs> Oh, that, that, that's actually a very good question. Are we meeting next week? JL oh, no, no. and ZFS. What day does it fall on? I'll look at the calendar here. Wednesday. Uh, well, yeah, Wednesday. What? <laughs> Any major holidays? Let's see. Next week. <laughs> uh, I will be at Kiss Communication uh, Conference, so nope. Well, over here they celebrate after Christmas sales, so those aren't quite holidays, but well, I suppose if you celebrate, it's a hard holiday. The capitalist. I'll actually be at home, so I'm very available. So I'm tempted to say, let's just see who shows up. Anyway, I'll be around, and hopefully, I won't be interrupted by three phone calls during this call. I hear time. you. And okay, we've okay, we've got the links coming. Thank you, Jan. But wait, yeah, just you're the encyclopedia the right, entry. Uh, links of things. To this, uh... is certified in all of those things. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> sounds expensive. Yes, it sounds like uh, the expensive software from the time of closed source Unix. Yes. Back when I was it's... making open source builds on Solaris to get my job done. Wow. Certified everywhere, usable nowhere, or something like that. It's Java. Yeah. <laughs> And that still sucks. So we're good, or do we have other final points and questions and topics? We and have the direct topic still. Uh... Oh, we touched on it briefly. Antonigo, your questions answered, or I did yeah, get mostly... interesting. Go ahead. So it's, the it's... important part which we haven't mentioned is for a storage system of any capacity, but especially as it becomes more expensive, it's important to uh, consider what you want to use it for. Maybe what's your use case? How do your files look like? So how large are they? How are they written? So maybe the access patterns, growth predictions, uh, yeah. change rate and stuff so that you can do capacity planning, not just for storage capacity, but also for basically IOPS and latency purposes. So just let you know what you need. What deadline does do you have to uh, meet See, for performance. That's a uh, recording space data versus acting as a CDN are completely different design. Yeah. So, so uh, let's say a transactional database is something completely different from uh, just an archive system at the extreme end. So, at one, or let's say you at one time you have a quickly changing database which has to be consistent and you care about basically single threaded random writes and at worst synchronous single threaded uh random writes which is about basically this is my quickly changing mysql or postgres server with yeah the latency and is about the important part about performance and it doesn't matter if your total system throughput is good if each individual user gets annoyed by waiting for the system to finally commit their rights right so Antronik you're with you said scientists so that means a whole bunch of comma separated text <laughs> for large data sets maybe that, that is correct yes but here's here's the problem that i learned after working up for months with them is that they also don't know what they need right so if i ask them hey do you do you want this to be like more about performance or more about the size like we can sacrifice the size for um, let's say better rights for example right or um are we talking a lot of big files or 
uh, you know, multiple uh, or, or large, large uh, quantity of small files. Mm -hmm. And the answer, the answer is both. So, you yeah. know, it depends, are they working or on DNA data or analyze DNA data? And th that's where I'm having a problem with. If someone told me, hey, I'm trying to build a CDN, I know exactly what to do. Right. But then, you know, scientists pop up, pop out, and now I have no idea what to do. So uh, what you could do if you have any system similar to what we have is to, uh, and it happens to be a Solaris or FreeBSD system, you could use uh, D-Trace to uh, collect uh, statistical data. Mm -hmm. Just, let's say you have an existing system, which is a lot smaller, but currently more or less handles the same workload. Uh, you could use D-Trace to... Uh, just uh, basically get a trace of the I.O. they do, uh, but they f find all read, write, and so on system calls by this user and find out what the access pattern is. And then you can try to visualize it, analyze it, do a bit of statistical yeah. analysis on it, get a ZF, uh, sorry, D-Trace can even do a bit of it uh, as ASCII art for you, mm -hmm. giving yeah. you a nice uh, histogram uh, or distribution and so on. But for larger data and longer busy time series, get it into some kind of time series d database all your I.O. or a representative subset of all your I.O.s if it's too expensive to get everything. Get every thousandth or so I.O. Uh, for long enough and have a look what we're really doing. I haven't done it that methodically, but that's uh, if I had to, that's what I would try to do. Do you, are you a consultant to them, or are you an employee of the of theirs? No, I'm I'm a contractor, but the problem is that I'm the only sysadmin on all of their systems. Gotcha. So it's uh, it's it's hard, and the the other problem is that I'm their first sysadmin. Uh, before they had people who were like titled sysadmins, but all they had to do was either install software or um, add a user. That there was nothing else, right? Um, they never manage storage. They never manage networking. So it's kind of complicated. Then you have another big task ahead of you if you're supposed to do it. And yep. that is taking inventory of the shadow IT they do know they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, that's a whole other thing for next year is to, you know, figure out how to so, turn the, the, the technical things into proper IT, like from asset management to inventory management. Uh, not to just documentation from a issues. point, you also basically have to accust uh, to um, acclimatize the or basically accustomize the organization to having something like a process even. Mm -hmm. for, for example, I've seen a horror story of a, of a company I had to uh, work with. And it turns out they had like 200 something 2.5 inch external USB drives. Mm -hmm floating around because uh, yeah during COVID they didn't have a pro real process so they just bought a new hard drive when someone said they needed to move some data <laughs> and stuff like that and doing photo shoots and video shoots and so on. nobody knew what was on there which version what was what and so on wow and they just had a complete clusterfuck because sometimes they had data given to them and no idea who had which uh, rights to the data from a copyright perspective. So they had potentially data where they couldn't even guesstimate if they were allowed to use it for this purpose because stuff just was done. Uh, supposedly authorized at the time, but not properly documented. And it was it wasn't known if two files are identical in size, are they the same, and so on. Are they supposed to be the same? Is this a partial aborted copy of something, or is this an intentional subset of something? 
ah, it's, we're still digging through that mess. And yeah, I hope you're not about to find out something that <laughs> bad for your organization, but uh, you will probably find that a lot of stuff which should have been preserved uh, has been lost because it wasn't, it was lost maybe when some hardware was decommissioned. And the other way around that the existing local storage is uh, overflowing with crap and you don't even know what part of it is the crap. Because even the users who created it no longer know if they ever knew. And that's annoying because this is necessary friction, but it is friction to basically organize your data and a customizing an organization to that can be painful for everyone. I, I, I also mm -hmm. noticed that for these kind of organizations, also teaching them about ZFS things is complicated. Like one of the things that I got a problem with is uh, uh, they would say things like, oh, uh, this is the same server, but why is it copying the files when I am moving data from a folder to folder. And now I have to explain, oh, but it's actually a data set, right? So well, with OpenZFS 2.2. Yeah, block Yes, copies. we know. <laughs> That's been litigated. In theory, <laughs> there is a solution. I don't know that I would want to trust it at that scale already. Yeah. Or maybe wait a yeah. few uh, bug fix releases for others to Block find floating. yeah the whatever demons there may be in this in there, code. Yeah. Um but Fear that's just an overabundance of cautions, I hope. Mm -hmm. Um that that that's one interesting issue when you when people come from ZFS into there. And the other one is like they think that they are buying say 1.5 petabytes of disks. And then they say, hey, why does it show, say, 1.2 petabytes of available storage, for yeah, example? The, right? the first so. time you lose data to the marketing, the <laughs> basically when no, at petabyte scale, it becomes really painful if you get, if you let, because it's another factor of, well, 1,000 out of 1,024, if you look at it in software, which we, uh, um, basically presents binary petabytes at worst or terabytes mm -hmm. because with every new prefix you escalate to you take an other basically larger error between the thousand and 1024 times n yep so at a kilobyte it's not much at a megabyte at a gigabyte it's at a terabyte and now we're at a petabyte so yeah every time the difference gets larger and that's the first time you take a hit then there's parity and spares mm -hmm. and the thing to watch also is that you can't add um, parity and spares retroactively uh, to d8 yep. or you and, well raids do it raids to the uh, raid z coming. Yeah. With the expansion, the thing to watch out for is that the parity to data ratio doesn't improve for old data. So you get the That's new blocks if you uh, really grow a rate Z by adding a device. You get the new storage by moving everything carefully around while moving basically a barrier. But what you don't get is the better ratio of data to parity, and you can't add, as far as I know, a new parity device. So you can't go add a disk to go from RAID Z2 to RAID Z3, as far as I know. And that, so you're basically locked to the parity uh, level you initially created the VDEV with for everything but mirrors. But I got to say, and I did write a whole report about this when I showed it months ago, I think on the jail call, mm -hmm. that there are some features that ZFS has that the scientific community is not even aware of. 
like one thing which... oh, and you wrote a nice wiki page did you not Yes, and uh, cool. like Good, man. like the 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 way that the whole scientific community, not just my community, that has been handling quotas, is that like they would run du inside the shell mm. script for every project, and then they would send an email to the user saying, "Oh, you are uh, over your quota." Like that's how they used to work. Okay, that's a really bad uh, implementation of quo quota. Okay, we're in the weeds. We're in the weeds. Help! Help! But one thing which is totally on topic here, which would potentially be very useful to your users, is to uh, look at someone else's already done. It's basically a web interface to get the ZFS data sets from the, let's say, archive, petabyte archive to the work machine. Mm -hmm. So that, that you have a, a way for them basically to go into a web interface, pick a data set, and say, I want this replicated here, and then they get an ETA and so on, and mm -hmm. an email when it's done, and a status bar in a browser, which updates every few seconds or min a minute or something, mm -hmm. so that you can tell them, that, yeah, this will be a lot faster using ZFS send and uh, receive uh, with a well-optimized buffer on each side and so on, than mm -hmm. doing an async or something, or... Uh, NFS mount. NFS... Uh, Exactly, a uh, CP dash R or whatever, or even some graphical front end or something. Just basically, I want this data set. And then you would presumably give each user a data set as well. Yeah, home uh, directory, and then you would have exactly. a data that, set, that's what they do. sub data set, and then you would just receive the data set under its name in there, and then they can do an incremental send back. and stuff like that. So that would potentially give them such an acceleration by using faster bulk copying and avoiding doing unnecessary copies if they're working on ZFS systems that you may have enough of a just time saving and convenience for them that they will at least the ones doing scientific computing you mentioned and so on, I can see them basically getting interested in the payoff which ZFS can give them. Maybe that it's worth it to them because they save so much time. Instead of trying to hold on to everything in their home dear, they can just get rid of things and know that they can quickly get it back. Yep. So we've covered the politics, the the mechanicals, everything in between. Um, hopefully what I've posted is obvious. It came out of a conversation about mm -hmm. special metadata allocation classes. And basically, you, Jan, you mentioned data analysis. This was a posted yeah, syntax fine, to fine. analyze files and then say, hey, we can kick a certain size off into our uh, special allocation class that's all flash and have a nice day. So, yeah, that's a technique like thing that you can do is you can basically have blocks up to a certain size be yep. also allocated from the metadata special allocation Correct. class. Like. Exactly. So, and you can quickly add new ones if they start to fill up. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, Antronik, does it thing... answer your questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Excellent. And unlike other kinds of offloading, if the special location class uh, overflows, it just it's just the performance downgrade. It's not that the pool fills up and you can no longer write. It will just be forced to allocate from the unsuitable or less suitable storage devices until the pool is completely full. Okay, well, things are getting noisy here. If that's it, I say we call it. I can hang around, but then you can enjoy all the background noise. Um, I wish you all fantastic holidays. Enjoy and the party. Uh, that would be it. Yeah, it's party time. Oh, oh, oh. Great. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.